animal studies fairly consistently show that higher protein diets are associated with more atherosclerosis. And Muscle, some, but, a new but study by no means the University all, of Pittsburgh says too much protein can lead to a buildup of plaque in your arteries. You've seen the headlines, right? You might be eating an artery damaging amount of protein. Eating this much protein can be bad for your health. Is too much protein bad for your heart? And my personal favorite, heart disease linked to eating too much protein. I don't know how many more ways we can falsely be told that protein is bad for us. First it's our kidneys, then cancer, then blood sugar, now your heart. It's not just that these claims are sensational, they are set up and stated with such conviction that you think there is no room for doubt. Even less doubt when you see that some of this comes from an extremely noteworthy source. But as usual, where there is a dash of truth, the devil's in the details, and these details are juicier than a steak from Gordon Ramsay. I cannot believe that I have to take you all back into the abyss of misleading studies and awful agenda-driven articles, back to the half-truths and hot takes from the internet. But I hope you got your tinfoil hats with you because they have shown conclusively that protein is destroying our hearts until you see who they did the studies on. But then they did it again, and oh, you see the protein that they were using. So then it forces us to ask, if this was all meant to mislead us, why? So that is what we're getting into today, guys. Yes, another agenda call. Another one. I just made that word up. It's an agenda article, and I'm not taking it back. But we will also be explaining the little bit of truth that is in these claims and answer if this is true, what do we do? In general, I try not to be an alarmist about things, but there's a pattern here that I'm noticing that I can't not talk about. So I do have a warning at the end of this episode that I am unfortunately very confident in. So with all that out of the way, guys, my name's Andrew with Holistic Motion. Let's get into it. The article that has been getting a lot of buzz here comes to us from the New York Post, titled, You Might Be Eating an Artery Damaging Amount of Protein, New Study Warns. They start this out by saying, turns out there is such a thing as too much protein. A new study published in the journal Nature Metabolism suggests that eating too much protein is bad for your arteries. Our study shows that dialing up your protein intake in pursuit of better metabolic health is not a panacea. You could be doing real damage to your arteries. That quote comes from Babak Razzini, MD, PhD, and professor of cardiology at the University of Pittsburgh. Nearly all of these articles use that exact wording. High protein is not a panacea. Weird. Well, it didn't take long to start hitting the parts of this research that don't really hold up under any scrutiny. First, where it begins to fall apart. According to a survey of an average American diet over the last decade, Americans generally consume a lot of protein, mostly from animal sources. Further, nearly a quarter of the population receives over 22% of their calories from protein alone. They always make sure to say, from animal sources anytime there is a protein bad agendical. They smoosh that in there just to make sure you kind of start to worry. It sort of plants that seeds of fear around animal foods, right? Kind of like I already covered in episode 71. But even the a lot of protein that they say is based on little to nothing. Think of how many Americans are just over consuming all calories and then end up accidentally getting high protein in their diet. Or like most Americans, just eating so much processed food that just happens to have a little bit of protein in them. But just because something has high protein slapped on the outside of the box doesn't mean it's true. And it doesn't mean that Americans eat a lot of protein, at least not compared to their carb and fat intake. Let's take a look at myself to consider what they might mean here. I weigh about 190 pounds or so right now. 22% of my calories would be 178 grams of protein. If you are overweight or have a decent bit of lean mass on you, that 22% most likely will not be enough to get you at least one gram per pound of body weight, which is conclusively one of the best things that you can be doing for body recomposition. But this gets even funnier. Remember they said nearly 25% of the US gets over 22% of their protein from animal sources? Well, over 73% of the US is at least overweight, if not severely obese, according to many, many sources. So I'm going to go out on a limb here and say little to none of those people are getting 22% or more of their calories in animal protein or even protein at all for that matter. 
Protein is a very hard macro to consume in high quantities. No one consumes hundreds of grams of protein on accident unless they are over consuming in general. So it is much more likely what you guys, that's right, highly processed calorie dense foods that are high in carbs and fat and low in protein. I say that not because fat and carbs are bad, but because it's just much easier to overconsume. But I don't even think I need to go out on a limb saying that, do I? According to the British Medical Journal in 2023, Research suggests that between 60 and 90% of the standard American diet consists of foods and beverages that are highly processed. 60 to 90%. That is insane. Do you have any idea how hard it would be to consume 90% processed food and still get adequate protein? If we use an actual high protein processed food, let's say Quest protein cookies, it is possible to get some decent looking macros and calories, not great, but passable, I guess. For example, if I eat 13 of these, I would meet my protein requirements and almost hit my calorie needs. The problem is that nobody is eating 90% of their processed food as protein enriched ones. There's this funny meme out there where an article shows that 12% of people are buying the majority of red meat and another one where it says only 12% of the US is metabolically healthy. This is like a funny little Pareto distribution, you know? That's the kind of thing that we're seeing here. 25% of the US is supposedly getting 22% of their calories from animal protein, and almost 73% of the US is overweight. I wonder who the 27% remainder is. The joke basically writes itself. Sure, correlation isn't causation, but this is pretty funny to see, if nothing else. That trend is likely driven by the popular idea that dietary protein is essential to healthy living, says Rosini. Yes, because it is. We can survive with little to no carbs and relatively low fat, not low or no protein. Where these claims started was a study on cell metabolism, specifically a mechanism, and the nutrient they are really attacking here, leucine. More on that later, because that is the most diabolical thing that I have ever seen. I'm going to make this super simple. A mechanistic study focuses on understanding a specific process or action at a very detailed level, like a single step in a longer sequence. It's like saying that step one directly causes step seven or something without looking at all the steps and factors that could influence the outcome between these points. In the context of biological or health sciences, this means that while a mechanistic study might reveal how a particular molecule or gene functions in a cell, let's call that step one, Concluding that this function leads to a specific health outcome in a whole organism, call that step seven, requires additional evidence. The intervening steps could involve complex interactions with other biological systems, environmental influences, genetic variations, and more, which could alter or influence the final outcome. Mechanistic studies aren't bad. They're just a very early step that shouldn't be applied to the whole without real world testing. For example, Resveratrol in red wine has health benefits, or glutamine being neurotoxic, both true in mechanistic studies, but not true in human studies. So again, before I read this next part, this is a study done on cells. Interestingly, the analysis of circulating amino acids showed that leucine, an amino acid enriched in animal-derived foods like beef, eggs, and milk, is primarily responsible for abnormal macrophage activation and atherosclerosis risk suggesting a potential avenue for further research on personalized diet modification or precision nutrition. Animal foods are the boogeyman again, guys. Hmm. Perhaps blindly increasing protein load is wrong, Rosini said. Instead, it's important to look at the diet as a whole and suggest balanced meals that won't inadvertently exacerbate cardiovascular conditions, especially in people at risk of heart disease and vessel disorders. Rosini also notes that these findings suggest differences in leucine levels between diets enriched in plant and animal protein might explain the differences in their effect on cardiovascular and metabolic health. A balanced diet, as he says, is something that will take a lifetime of personal testing to figure out. There is no one size fits all with this. Whenever someone claims there is, it always has an agenda behind it. In this case, it sounds like the agenda is leaning toward plant foods, plant-based diets. The problem with balancing any meal, as he says, is that no matter what you do, for each change, there are pros and cons. 
A perfect diet is a unicorn. It does not exist. Luckily, this research didn't start and end at cells. They ended up going into rodents and humans as well. In the rodent study, they had three different categories. Low protein, meaning 7% protein, moderate protein, meaning 21%, and high protein, meaning 46%, and looked at the lesions in blood vessels over an eight-week period. The high protein group showed higher levels of plaque and lesions, but the mice they used were APOE knockout mice. What that means is that these kinds of mice have a gene removed that causes them to have very low lipoprotein clearance, high LDL and cholesterol, meaning that they have high levels of heart disease. This is like running a study with participants under 5'7 and feeding them a bunch of rice, then saying, huh, turns out rice stunts growth. This is what these animals do. They get heart disease. Also, for anybody under 5'7, I'm sorry for using you as a reference for short. I love you. Yes, this suggests something interesting that may be worth looking at. But imagine that we got a more measured conclusion from this. This could basically be summed up as, oh, we got an outcome that we were nearly guaranteed to get because of the subjects that we used. So naturally, we take the next step up the animal hierarchy and look at how this is applied to humans. So we've got two different studies with two different groups. The first study consumed shakes fasted, low and high protein in this case, meaning 10% of their calories and 50% of their calories from protein. The other group consumed a meal instead of a shake, 15% of their calories from protein as a mixed meal and 22% of their calories from protein. It makes sense to have both of these because we can get a little bit more isolated by looking at just the shake and it's a little bit more realistic doing it as a whole meal, right? Of course, that shake is worth looking at. Not all shakes are created equal. Anybody who's bought protein knows that there's some terrible ones out there. In fact, this one, Boost Protein, is, well, let's read the first six ingredients. Water, corn syrup, modified milk ingredients, sugar, vegetable oils as canola, high oleic sunflower, and corn oil, soy protein isolate. Yeah, it is possible that might not be the best protein to be used when your interest is what protein does. Protein isn't even in the first five ingredients. I digress. When we look at the human examples here, what they showed was a short-term activation of mTOR post-meal and jump to, oh, okay, so that's bad for your heart, which is slightly true in some contexts. Also, I covered way more about mTOR, longevity, and protein in my last episode, number 71. And if you think this one is wild, that one might actually be crazier. I'll link it at the end of this video. The problem with looking at protein and saying, okay, that causes problems, is that we can apply that to pretty much any macro or micronutrient. Too many carbs, insulin spike. Too much fat, high cholesterol. Too much vitamin A, oh, toxicity. Do you drink water? Well, that's not good because water strips minerals from you when you urinate, stupid. Not to mention that most of these nutrients will level out quite quickly and only show a major spike short term after a meal. Chronic elevation of these things is a concern. Acute is not. I cannot overstate the complexity, effort, and attention it would take in your diet to never see anything spike up after a meal. That is what happens. It's like a rush of cars entering the highway after a big sports event. That is what happens. If this really mattered, there are easy solutions like going for a walk after every meal, being more intentional with your order of food consumption, ratios of your food, speed of consumption, etc., etc. There are so many options. We see diabetics manage these things with ease. But with the way this is framed, that any elevation in anything in your blood is treated as a cause for concern, it's like the only option that is correct is avoiding all of these dangerous foods by becoming one of those people who practice crazy levels of inedia or fasting. One of my favorites being Hira Ratan Manek, who claimed to get all of his sustenance by gazing at the sun for nearly 30 years. Please don't try this. He was caught eating food on several occasions and everybody who has made this claim has died or been caught lying. But hey, at least they avoided spiking their mTOR blood sugar, right? I had a mentor once who swore that that was possible to do. And it was incredible how much respect it made me lose for him. Yeah, anyway, you can show pros and cons of any food. Ultimately, this is a lot of fear mongering coming from genetically modified mice. So you can look at it and go, hmm, that is interesting. And hope that at some point in time, they try to apply it directly to humans in a randomized control trial. But does it require any concern beyond that? Probably not. But credit where this is due, this study was actually done quite well for what it was trying. Lane Norton actually points that out here. 
It's not a bad study. The study itself was actually quite well done. In fact, I love the fact that in the mouse study, they also had groups of mice where they took the medium or the moderate protein diet and they supplemented with leucine to match the leucine content of the high protein diet because we did something similar looking at skeletal muscle and saw basically the same level of protein synthesis, basically showing that leucine was the key amino acid regulating this. And they did the same thing. A final bit with this study is that it showed a strong correlation between higher protein intake and mitigating body fat gain. So for all the complaints, all the fear mongering around protein and heart disease, you know what's even worse for your heart? Obesity. You know what is a really effective tool for fat loss? High protein diets. This is literally stepping over dollars to pick up pennies as usual. I just, I can't stand these kinds of studies because they tell people protein is bad for you. Then next week it's, no, fat is bad for you. Then the next week it's, oh, carbs are bad for you. So people go, well, damn, I guess it doesn't matter what I eat because it's all bad. And then they end up going and eating trash because, well, everything is bad. If you're someone who's struggling trying to figure this out, dealing with all the confusion around these topics, go to holisticmotion.com, go to my contact page, go schedule a free consult with me, and we can get you some no-nonsense health and fitness coaching advice. Also, if you're listening on Spotify, I've had a huge increase on listeners there for some reason and would really appreciate it more than you know if you could go give me a five-star rating. Seriously, it helps a ton and I will love you forever. And now for the final bit. I don't wanna to act too much like spaghetti and get completely lost in the sauce here, but this is three episodes in a row that are attacking healthy life choices, two episodes in a row that are attacking protein, not just attacking protein, but a specific amino acid in it. Leucine, one of the most incredible amino acids for optimizing your health and maximizing muscle gain. Do you wanna know what foods leucine is most common in? Animal protein. Wanna know what foods they say to eat less of? You guessed it. I am shocked, shocked. Well, not that shocked. I posted about this on Twitter a few weeks ago. I don't wanna be an alarmist, but the coordinated attack on animal proteins is something we should be worried about. Leucine is being demonized by a lot of people and it's not an accident. We're being offered plant-based meat. We're being offered lab-grown meat, like I covered in episode 57. So it just begs the question, when did meat, the thing that nearly every creature has been eating since they came into existence, become bad? Guys, thank you for sticking around to the end and shout out to all the new subscribers. Make sure to watch that last episode for more on the protein paranoia, or you can click this top video and see what I've been up to lately. So till next time, guys, my name is Andrew with Holistic Motion. See y'all later.